My name is Ed Taylor. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate and Academic Affairs here at the University of Washington. And it's been a special afternoon for, for me today. I've been walking around with our invited guests, people taking pictures, asking for autographs, and stopping us everywhere we go. You'd think I was in the presence of a professional wrestler or something. It was quite <laughs> I'd like to welcome all of you students, alumni, friends, and this room should be full of students, undergraduate students. You're the reason why we are here. Students from the University of Washington of our drama classes has created a performance for us at the moment, and I'd like to introduce them. Students from the Creating Drama class will perform two traditional Haitian children's songs they learned as part of their class to dramatize Mountains Beyond Mountains. Would you please? Thank you all, it's just wonderful. One such example of the kinds of things that have been happening on campus since this book was selected. This is the inaugural year of the Common Book. It began as a way to connect students to the campus and to connect the campus to, to students. There was a group of people, an expanding group of people that was tasked with choosing a book. You can imagine the task of choosing a single book for this community, as diverse a community as this. There was a list of about 25 books, and in the end, Mountains Beyond Mountains was the selection. I think it was a good choice. The task was to find a book that students would read, and I believe you read it, a book that would be teachable, something we can teach from, something we can learn from, and, and a book that would help us create a more thoughtful public. The work that has gone into this project has extended across the campus. I'd like to, to thank my colleague, Dr. Christine Ingerbritsen, who, who called me and a number of other faculty and, and staff and members of the community and said, I, I, I think that it's worth having a common book. I, I think it's worth reading together. I think it's worth inculcating freshmen into a, an academic community. I think it will work, she said. We choose the right book, we put our heads together. Dr. Ingebrigtsen is professor in Scandinavian studies. She recently authored Scandinavia in World Politics and co-edited Small States in International Relations. After earning her PhD from Cornell in International Relations, Dr. Ingebrigtsen has published extensively on the Nordic state, European unity, and European integration. But most importantly, she's called us together here and called us together around this book. It was an idea that I believe has come to fruition, and here we are. So I want you to join me in thanking Dr. Christine Ingerbritsen for this concept and for bringing us here together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Tonight we welcome Paul Farmer to the University of Washington campus. And Paul, Tracy Kidder has made your story accessible to so many people. We thank you for your leadership in founding Partners in Health to reimagine how we can deliver health care on a global scale, and bringing together intellectual fields important to our executive vice provost here tonight, medicine, anthropology, and economic development in novel new ways. When resources were either non-existent or scarce, you saw possibilities of how we could deliver those differently. Our common book, now in its pilot year, provided 6,500 copies of the same book to our University of Washington students. The campus committee selected the title specifically because of the inspirational work 
that you do, Paul. My dream was to bring you here to share you with this community. We know the problems of tomorrow will require interdisciplinary knowledge. You've demonstrated how to engage these working across disciplinary boundaries. We know the problems of tomorrow will be transnational. You're what scholars would call a rooted cosmopolitan or a norm entrepreneur seeking to structure the global agenda. You're passionate about your work, and this passion began as an undergraduate student. This was very attractive to our committee who selected the book. As we tell our students, discover your passion and your career will follow. We applaud your work in combining a deep understanding of theory with also a knowledge of place. What we did not anticipate is how this project has become more like a social movement than a project socially engineered by a Scandinavian acting dean and dedicated to norm the campus. Thank you for being here tonight. This was part of our dream to connect you with the University of Washington students with thanks to Dr. Peter Small of the Gates Foundation who connected us together. Welcome Dr. Paul Farmer, please. Thank you very much. I read about what you were doing here from Christine, also friends of mine on the faculty. Um, I, uh, a group of anthropology students wrote a very affecting poem. I was moved to see the study notes uh, that were put together by members of the faculty and to see just how seriously um, all of you took uh, this exercise in building community through reading something. Now, of course, uh, Ophelia and I are honored that, uh, and I'm sure Tracy Kidder, who will be coming here in February, is also honored that you chose that book, um, but because you've been so serious about this, no, th these questions of social justice and, and how we as relatively privileged people can be in the world, you took these questions seriously, so I'm going to also take uh, my time with you seriously and ask uh, uh, some, some questions about where I think we might want to go as a, as a nation, as, a, as people in the university. And I'm going to start with my greatest teacher, uh, which is not so much a person, but a place. And as the wonderful drama club uh, has already guessed, that would be Haiti. And uh, I went to Haiti, as Christine said, um, because of uh, my involvement as an undergraduate. And that's one of the things I most like saying when I am able to, sp uh, to speak to at, at undergraduate universities is um, to underline the importance of student activism. And uh, in fact, Ophelia Dahl also uh, went to Haiti uh, when she was 18 years old and is still working on these projects today. So many things happened uh, to us when we were young um, and set a course for us that uh, is still um, is still the course that we're on today. So I'm, I look back for images uh, from around those years, and this is not really, this is probably 1985, not 1983, but this is a very dusty mountain top, as you can see, and in the background you can make out a little bit of a reservoir, a lake, it's not a good picture, uh, and the beginnings of a school and some other buildings, but as you can see, there are no trees there. And this, I wanted to find pictures from 1983, which was the first time that uh, both of us went there. Um, and when there were even fewer, there were no buildings, no, there's certainly no school. And this was a squatter settlement formed by peasant farmers who had been flooded out of the, uh, the Fertile Valley when a hydroelectric dam had been built. Now you, you know this since you all read the book, and I'm sure everyone who was assigned the book read it without exception. Um, <laughs> That's another, you know, sort of sad reflection. I thought back on books I was assigned as an undergraduate and tried to sort of guess what fraction of them I had read to completion. Anyway, assuming <laughs> that you have read this book, you know the story. And I wanted to talk about transformations, you know, our own personal transformation, at, you know, going from being um, college students to 
uh, remaining engaged in this work to this day, in different ways, of course, and in different places. So our own transformations, the transformation of, uh, of communities, of course, these, these are not transformations that we wrought upon these communities. We were part of a, of, uh, a movement, Christine used that word, or Ed did, and I think it's a very stirring mo mo word, and that's why I put it in the title of my talk. Um, so transformations in communities, transformations in ourselves, and transformations in patients, because I later became a physician, as you know, um, and transformation in, in the ideas that we can have of what is possible. And I'm going to speak about each of these transformations, but leave plenty of time for us to, to discuss discuss amongst ourselves. So this is, let's just say 15 years later. So this is 1985, I wish I had 83, and this is more recently. And as you can see, you can tell, we tried to put in and did in, in fact build a modern hospital with a warehouse full of medications, um, planted trees all over that mountainside. It is now uh, shady, in fact, uh, I, I remember almost getting into fisticuffs. I actually, I'm kidding here. I've never hit anyone six, since sixth grade. But um, a doctor who said that it was too dark inside the clinic and he wanted to sh cut down the trees. So, um, and he wasn't kidding. And this transformation, of course, took place over many years. It was led by Haitians. And it's not the story that I'm going to tell tonight. Instead, I want to focus on um, some examples of uh, our own work and how it was transformed. Now, I see a couple of friends from <clears throat> Lakeside School, and you've seen a couple of these images before, but the rest of you have not seen them. And also, I have some updates about transformation, transformations that we're undergoing now as an organization, Partners in Health, as we move uh, deeper and deeper into Africa. So first, let me start with something that is, is a little bit on the nerdy side. That's OK at a university, I'm told. <laughs> And since this is the global hub of global health these days, I'm going to talk about global health. And I want to start with uh, a, a question that has uh, stimulated a great deal of interest among the undergraduate students in this country, and that's AIDS. And this has been very welcome interest, I've got to say. You know, when I uh, became, when, when I was training in infectious disease, which is the stage of training that comes after a residency in internal medicine or pediatrics, in my case, internal medicine. Um, this was a time when effective therapies for AIDS were being developed, the, uh, the mid-90s. By the mid-90s, we knew that if you use the right drugs in combination, you could transform AIDS um, from a, a fatal illness into a chronic uh, disease. And so that was very exciting. Except on the Haitian side, I mean, imagine going between Harvard and Haiti uh, very regularly, in fact. And I, I found myself sometimes in Haiti having patients beg me personally, as someone who was moving back and forth, for these medications, whereas I was sometimes at Harvard begging our patients to take the medications. And this, I would argue, is not a tenable personal situation. It's not good for one's mental health. And after all, this is all about my mental health. So <laughs> I decided, along with my coworkers, <clears throat> that in order to preserve my mental health, we would begin using these drugs in Haiti. And it was very difficult. And I'll show you why it was difficult in a second. Let me, uh, let me skip ahead first, though, to the year is 1998 now. So in 1998, I'm finished with my training. I'm in, a, in an academic uh, at a small community-based college. And, Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, <laughs> and uh, Partners in Health is growing, and uh, we're enjoying our work, and we, we introduce modern AIDS therapy in the middle of, a, of, of central Haiti. <laughs> now, the reaction to this, uh, we'd done, we'd done things like this before. For example, building a hospital like this in the middle of a squatter settlement in rural Haiti, that was also a, a sort of daring endeavor. Uh, but I have to say we weren't uh, entirely, th these efforts were not greeted with uh, a great deal of enthusiasm by everyone. Now the good news is the people who mattered most, the patients and their families, they were thrilled, as you might imagine. They did not say, for example, well, you know, I'm Haitian and this is a really poor country so it's not a good idea to give us these medicines, it's not cost effective. <laughs> so. Um, but that's, that, you know, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but 
I, and I showed, I get, I, again, I showed these, uh, this, this is 2002, just at the point where we're trying to scale up this treatment uh, so that we can reach more and more patients because at the time, HIV was the leading infectious killer of, of young adults in Haiti. So it seemed to be very important that we use these, as bro these medications effectively and as widely as possible. And we had some support from within the Haitian medical establishment, but uh, we did not find support everywhere. Now, I took these to, these are, these are from the, those of you who are freshmen um, or undergraduates that are learning how to read literature critically, these are from the best part of the paper, actually the only part you need to read, which is the abstract. Just throw away the rest of it. <laughs> and uh, actually, the dean will probably punish me for saying that later, so. <laughs> I'm looking for a quick escape out. So I know that you guys read, all of you, every week, The Lancet, <laughs> which is a premier medical journal. But on the off chance that you missed this edition in 2002, I'm going to, these are from two separate abstracts. And I've taken away the, the authors of the, of the, uh, the studies because I, I, I'm not trying to pick a fight, you know, nerds at war kind of thing, but rather to, to show you the prevailing mood about treating AIDS in Africa in very four places at, at this time. And uh, these are two different, these are from two different abstracts. And, uh, you know, and I've shown these to my students at Harvard Medical School and just asked a very simple question, which is, when you read these abstracts, do you think they are meant to start a conversation about treating AIDS in poor countries or to stop the conversation? And, you know, I'll leave you to conclude, but it's a very interesting time to have published these confident claims. For example, we know that it's important to prevent HIV, but it's probably also important to treat it, especially if it's the leading infectious killer of adults in the area. So the idea that these would be mutually exclusive endeavors did not seem to us to be sound policy or practice. And that's only part of the problem, um, that these, these were not mutually exclusive uh, activities. In 2002, this is what was going on, you know, because this is about cost effectiveness, right? So there's, that's an interesting thing. There's, there's two words held together by a hyphen, cost and effectiveness. Both parts are interesting, cost uh, and the effectiveness. On the cost front in 2002, this was happening. Now, um, I just went back to my co I was in Haiti at the time, and I I have uh, had this really crackerjack research assistant who had just uh, finished her undergraduate training and is working at Partners in Health for a couple of years. She's now in graduate school in health policy. And I, uh, I wrote her uh, an email uh, from Haiti. Yes, we did have high-speed internet access, better than most hotels in New York, I might add. But anyway, <laughs> um, I wrote a note saying, how much does it cost to treat average wholesale price a, an American patient? you know, with these two drug regimens. And again, those of you interested in the specifics can look at the, which drug regimens they are. And it basically, it was about $10,000 per patient per year. And, and then I said, well, how much are we paying with a mix of concessionally priced drugs from the manufacturers and also generic medications? And the answer was about between six and $700 per patient per year. And then the last figure was the International Dispensary Association, which is the largest nonprofit uh, manufacturer of drugs in the world, and they were able to procure them already at that time for as low as $300 per patient per year. I I'll add right now that it's about $125 per patient per year as I speak now, and there's more to that story if we have time. But here's the re reason I put up these figures. Not to scare, the, scare you into thinking this is going to be uh, a presentation full of graphs, but just to ask, if you're talking about cost and effectiveness, then you would assume that to make such confident claims about cost effectiveness, cost is fixed and not in one year all over the map, in one single year. Now this is not a trend because that trend went even further down. This is just one year. So I was a little bit skeptical, as were my coworkers, about whether or not we could use cost effectiveness as the primary uh, compass for our work in Haiti taking on AIDS and other problems. Now, on the effectiveness part, I will point out that we only have one effective way to treat AIDS. It doesn't matter whether you're African or Haitian or from Seattle or Boston. If you have advanced HIV disease, 
a multi-drug combination like these two, for example, or some other, it's the only way we know how to treat the disease. So effectiveness is also an issue if you don't use the treatment. And so the whole idea, which became very dominant and still is dominant in public health, was one that we took on in a rather sassy way by naming our project the HIV Equity Initiative. That doesn't really ring very well in Haitian Creole, but they liked the idea. And as I mentioned, we started in 1998, and we used the model that we learned from tuberculosis control, which is, you know, and you can, many in this room can imagine why it is, you don't have to pay for tuberculosis diagnosis and care, because it's considered a public good for public health. It's, airborne, it's an airborne disease, so whether you're in King, Kings County or in Haiti, the idea is the same. You get diagnosed and you're treated and the costs are not borne by the patient. So we use the same thing, but lots of really interesting things happen. I'd like to ask you to imagine two of them. First, before I go on to the next images, which again, I, I showed at Lakeside last year, but the rest of you haven't seen them. Think about what it's like to be in rural Haiti or, or urban Africa for that matter, to be a doctor or a nurse in a hospital where the leading infectious causes of death, and the leading causes of admission to that hospital are AIDS and tuberculosis. And you're admitting these patients in the hospital, but you don't have the tools. So many of you have been thinking about the brain drain, but it's not just about salaries for the doctors and nurses. It's also about what's it like to take care of people when you don't have the tools of your trade. If I were in their situations, I would flee also. And to quote one young Kenyan doctor, I did not go to medical school to become a mortuary attendant. So the impact on morale uh, in launching this was very significant. Um, the staff had more work to do in a way, but they were more effective. But then let me show you an example uh, of, of personal transformation. And, and I, I, I won't apologize for using this image. This is a young man named Joseph maybe about 26 years old. And um, he showed up in, uh, in, in a clinic that we were running uh, as part of this scale-up effort. And I'm sure you can guess that he had not only AIDS, but also tuberculosis, which is the typical double whammy uh, that is faced by poor people with HIV disease. Now, he'd come into the hospital um, against his, not against his will, that's his mother, of course, but he had given up already, and they had already uh, purchased a coffin for him. And, and again, this is about personal transformation, so you can imagine what happens when Joseph, like anybody else here who has advanced HIV disease, is given this treatment, he responds to therapy and gets better. But that's only, that's only part of the personal transformation. So Joseph's personal transformation continued. He didn't just get better he got involved in the movement. So here you see Joseph you know, seeing his community health worker. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about that too much today because I wanna have time, but also here he is speaking at a health and human rights conference in front of pictures of himself. You can see projected behind him pictures of, him, of himself. So his transformation continues as well. Um, and uh, you know, this appeared in the World Health Report in 2004, and I thought, oh, I can't wait to bring a copy of this back to to Joseph, he'll, he'll love it, you know. And I brought it back to him and he looked at it and said, yeah, I'm a star. <laughs> so, and that was before he went, you know, to Toronto, so. <laughs> anyway, we scaled this work up. I'm, uh, I want to skip ahead though, so we, we do have time to talk. Um, and, and across central Haiti, and we got to meet people. And that's something I think doctors and nurses and social workers ought to be proud to do, and everybody else involved in this endeavor, because most of the, of the people who work on this project are, are neither doctors or nurses, they're community health workers. And we got to think about their problems, like sending their kids to school. And again, here's another, another something to think about. If you don't have these drugs, the antiretroviral drugs, and I'm talking about AIDS as, as an example, plenty of other problems um, that, that are faced um, and that are being considered in, in this university and, and you know, a, a lot of a activity in Seattle taking on the diseases of poverty that just 10 years ago was absent here. I mean, it's an amazing transformation of this city as well. And, and other cities are gonna catch up with Seattle 
and the National Institutes of Health and other major funders are also going to catch up with Seattle. But this is, a, a, as I said, a, a real global hub for um, the problems that afflict our patients. But once you get a patient like Joseph on therapy and he's no longer you know, shriveled up and, and unable to eat, and, um, what do you think people talk about in clinic if they don't talk about their symptoms? They start talking about their children and that they have no water and they have no house uh, or that they don't know how to read and write. Joseph gave this incredible interview. Um, the reason you know, Joseph went to all the way to Toronto is I never take pictures of patients very well. I, I just keep forgetting the camera. But uh, there's this one Harvard medical student who's now a doctor. He took the most fantastic pictures. He was one of Joseph's doctors. And so that picture kind of ricocheted around the world. Um, but I, I, um, I was transcribing an interview of one Haitian uh, uh, fellow who worked with us. He was interviewing Joseph, and he, I, of course, who's going to trans, translate and transcribe it? Me. You know, that's why I went to Harvard Medical School, trained in infectious disease, <laughs> took a PhD so that I could, you know, be a translator. Anyway, I was doing this without complaint, and uh, <laughs> actually, I had. I had earphones in, and I was using my computer, and I was rewinding, because I said he has a heavy accent, um, an accent that might be called in scholarly terms kind of a Hooterville accent. And, uh, and I kept on hitting replay to try and figure out what he was saying. And at one point, the, the guy interviewing him says, well, what would you like to do with your life now that you've you know, um, you know, come back from the dead? And he said, I want to learn how to read. He said, it's stupid that someone my age in the 21st century hasn't learned how to read. And it was full of you know, profundities like that. He also said, in response to another question, he said, wow, looking at the before and after pictures, you're a whole new person. And he said, oh, no, this is the person I was before I got sick. I'm just back. And that's Joseph. And th this effort, you know, and again, this image here to remind me to talk about teaching people to read or adults to read. This is a Haitian doctor who, prior to his experience with Partners in Health, wasn't very interested in poor people's uh, problems, maybe in their health problems, and certainly wouldn't have envisioned himself being involved in teaching uh, adult literacy, but he is now. And they, a lot of the young professionals who work with us, doctors and nurses, and this is a Haitian-run program, um, are, are, have become very involved in social justice work. And again, that's the theme of this, uh, this one book, One Love and Endeavor, is that you know, we're talking about you know, students and activism and getting involved as a university community. And that's what has happened to some very significant extent in our work in Haiti. Now, I want to move from Haiti and, and close by thinking about the, the place where I've spent much of my time the last, in the last uh, two years. Um, what if we don't do these sorts of things right way? What if we don't find new vaccines? What if we don't invest significant amounts of research in research to take on the diseases of the poor? What if we don't uh, recruit community health workers? What if we don't learn how to retain uh, professionals? Well, we already know. I mean, you can go. I met, I'm, I'm sure he's here today. I met this morning uh, a student here named Peter, who's from Lualand, which is exactly where I was when I went into the school. And I did take this picture myself. And it was in a school in Lualand, which is on, you know, on the shores of Lake Victoria. And I know what the teacher meant by writing save at the bottom of that. He meant do not erase. But when I saw this, I felt you know, like I was you know, been stabbed in the heart. And uh, Ophelia Dahl, the director of Partners in Health, we were there together, and what we saw in, around Lake Victoria were a lot of children and a, and a, a lot of older people, but a, a missing generation um, of young adults, the parents. And it was our intention, we were on the way to start our first project in Africa, Partners in Health's first project in Africa, and we were on our way to Rwanda. And there's, I was asked earlier really today, I've spent the whole day here at the university talking to students, and uh, someone asked, well, why Rwanda? And, and I said, well, it was actually, according to Ophelia, a, a very considered decision. Uh, because we, had, we knew that we, we could work in a very poor place. We knew that we, it would be a good idea to work with, where, where there was a significant amount of tuberculosis, HIV disease, and malaria. 
And we found that we had acquired over the previous 15 years significant experience working in settings riven by violence. So we were waiting for, to be invited by the Ministry of Health and the Clinton Foundation to start a project there. The first time I went uh, looking for a project site, because the Ministry of Health said, where do you want to work? We said, no, no, we don't want to answer that question. We want you to choose, because we're here to serve. And we learned how to do this. It took us about 15 years to learn how to say that correctly. But we worked it out. And they sent us to this place in northern uh, Rwanda, um, where the gorillas are. And I, w I have this special way, of a s very sophisticated way of assessing the quality of a public hospital. I look at the toilets and I look at the garden. Uh, you know, I've developed a 40-page questionnaire that you can just skip and just say toilets, garden. So electricity is helpful also, and you know, lab, and maybe a doctor or two. And we went to this place, and there were, there were doctors and nurses, and it was clean. And uh, so I made the mistake of going back to the capital and saying to the Minister of Health and the director of the National AIDS Program, you know, you know I sort of got real macho and said, you know, uh, we're partners in health. I mean, this is easy for us. We don't need to go a place where there's already electricity and a doctor and, you know. And the uh, Minister of Health looked at the director of the National AIDS Program. And he said, OK, we got just the place for you. <laughs> so so uh, this was Ringwabu Hospital, not. Um, and it had been abandoned since the genocide. And actually, I have to say, this is March 2005. And again, Ophelia Dahl was there and took these pictures. And you can see the uh, entry to the hospital, the laboratory, the operating room, and the wards. And that's what it looked like. And uh, you know, we sort of said, ah, yes, this is what we like. And because we really did know something about how to fix up, spruce up hospitals like this after having done this in Haiti. And so we got, in fact, we called on our Haitian team, uh, as you might imagine, to come with us. This is March 2005, and this is August. Same place, same. And that guy in the blue shirt, by the way, Inshuti Mubuzima means partners in health in, in the local language. The guy in the blue shirt is the minister who thought he was going to, you know, exile us to the Siberia of eastern Rwanda, uh, when in fact we showed him. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, we, we, we knew what to do. We knew, we knew we had to have uh, internet access to communicate with each other. And you know, people said, well, there's no telephone lines. And as people in Seattle have learned to say, yes, that's why you put in internet. And uh, we put in a modern pharmacy and a laboratory. And we were able to do something that a lot of NGOs were not able to do. All this in the public sector, by the way. And I will we'll have a chance to talk about this. I, I ran into the director, another, there are a lot of directors in Rwanda, I find, but uh, I ran into a, the director of another national AIDS program, and he's a, he's a statistician. He actually uh, went to school in, uh, in the United States at LSU. And this was our first maybe three months in the country, August it was. So we were just about this time, and he was very excited about our progress, and he said, but can you tell me, Paul? how there can be 150 NGOs working in Rwanda on AIDS, and they haven't even enrolled 150 patients on treatment. So, and uh, I thought, uh, you know, what I secretly thought is, yes, I can tell you why, uh, but I didn't think it was politic after only three months in the country to answer that. And I said, uh, well, I just, I'm new here. And, but I'll tell you guys why, and that is because a lot of money is invested in the office in the capital city, in the vehicles, in the doctor's salaries, in the expert consultants, in the conferences. And not enough money is invested in paying community health workers, making sure patients have enough to eat, making sure there are not hidden users' fees. This is not rocket science. And, uh, and so we were able to move quickly because we had learned in Haiti to remove all those things and enrolled a lot of people. And uh, this doesn't matter, and I can uh, save the data for you. And this is, again, a Rwandan team, although the Haitians uh, were there to help, some of the key Haitian staffers and some of our best uh, Boston-based PIHers moved there and still live there. And in fact, I, I moved there too, and I just came from there. And I'm very annoyed that there are no direct flights from Rwanda to Seattle. <laughs> and I'm asking people at the foundation to fix that. I'm just kidding. I would never ask that. 
But I just want to show you uh, something that uh, the folks, uh, my friends at Lakeside who are here haven't seen. And because I remember showing pictures, before and after pictures in Rwanda. We met with groups of patients. And they were very organized, actually, the group of patients in, in Rwanda. Um, you know, you'd, you'd, people said, well, we can't work in, in Africa on AIDS because there's too much stigma. And, you know, and these were not Africans, of course, saying this. There were people in you know, universities in America or public health experts. And I was skeptical because after the Haiti experience, I said, I said, well, we'll see. So we'd go out to these little villages and we'd announce we wanted to meet with HIV associations. And some people would say, well, no one's going to come. There's too much stigma. No one will show up. The place would be packed. And people would stand up and say, hi, my name's Claire. My CD4 count's 432. So they were already organized. And they were just waiting for us. And uh, of course, it was easy, not easy, but it was possible to enroll people very quickly. And, uh, and we met people like this guy, John. You know, this is, you know, if, if I, I tell you, you, you look at these pictures, you say, oh, it's not the same guy. Actually, unfortunately, John now needs to lose weight. I need to, <laughs> I, I need, I need to talk to him about doing some crunches or something. But th this is, this is a, um, un, you know, it's, this is not rare. I mean, I don't know why. We, I've told people who ask for these photos, sure, you can have them because John wants them circulated, but why don't you do your own before and after project? You know, why don't, why don't, why don't, because a lot of money is going into these projects in Africa. And, but it gets stalled, stalled somewhere, stuck somewhere. It's not going out to the rural areas. Because, you know, as a doctor or a nurse or anybody who's involved, I mean, wouldn't it be great just once in your life to see, I'm looking at it, a, a colleague of mine who's an internist, to see just once in your life someone go from Skeletor to needing Lipitor. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I, I think, uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's not befitting a, one, one book speaker. <laughs> anyway, to go, just to see that once in your life would be a great thing, but to see it hundreds of times, and, and again, this is something that's available to us. Uh, and so we just kept rolling. We've, we decided that it's been a very painful year for us in many ways because we, we have the uh, you know, we have partners in Africa. First of all, the communities are main partners who are saying, come on, Partners Health has to move more quickly. Um, and, and we've been working with the Clinton Foundation, and we just did, actually with the Gates Foundation, uh, just launched a training center uh, in, in Rwanda. And the purpose of having a training center in rural Rwanda is, of course, so that other groups will replicate this same work. And that's where we are. I, um, I made my first trip to Lesotho this summer, which was country number two in Africa. And I found that you can indeed be snowed in in Africa. So if anyone wants travel advice to Lesotho, better not to travel without a jacket in the summer, which, of course, there is the winter. So I did not major in geography. But I also insisted, I said, we've got to have a local name, like, you know, Inchuti Mubuzima, you know, which sounds good. That's Creole. And uh, my friends in Lesotho said, ah, I don't think it's a really long, you know, Basotho is a complicated language. And just call it PIH, Lesotho. And I said, no, no, I really, really think we need a local name. I really want us to have a local name. And so they said, OK, there it is. <laughs> so we gave up on the local name and, and just stuck with PIH Lesotho. But that is not a Basutu doctor there. There are very few. There is no medical school in the country. Some of you know Lesotho, which is a, a remarkable place. But it's right smack in the middle of South Africa with its giant teaching hospitals and cities. And this is a Haitian doctor, Jonas Rigaudin, in, uh, um, in the middle of rural Lesotho. And, and uh, we're doing the same uh, sort of effort. I don't know if, we're, if we've overreached, you know, if we're going to fall flat on our faces. I, Secretly, don't think so. I hope not. Uh, but we decided that even though we had never expanded this quickly before, that we would, uh, we would go into a third country. And so I just got back from Malawi. And Malawi, as you know, is, uh, is one of the poorest countries in the world. And uh, this is the place we went. It's called Neno. Uh, and this man at the, uh, the radio was a remarkable fellow. And I, I want to I close just talking about him. His name is Wilson. And he is not the district health officer for this district, Nano, 
because NANO has no district health officer and they have no district hospital really because to have a district hospital you have to have an operating room and a blood bank and be able to at least manage a, a cesarean section. That, that's again along with toilets, garden, is there a blood bank and can you do a C-section? You know, it's, it's a disaster. I mean, uh, obstetrical catastrophes are really the worst thing that I know of in medicine, period. So they had none of those. They didn't have their own DHO, district health officer. But this guy, after 30 years of doing this, you'd think he would have been burnt out. And, and he was the most excited and upbeat fellow that I have met in, in Africa in a long time. And I, I only show this, his picture to, to say there are heroes out there who you don't know. And Tracy Kidder doesn't know them. And, no one's writing books about them. But this man, to me, was, is one of those um, unsung heroes that I meet every day in my work. They may be community health workers. They most often are. They may be patients who become community health workers. They may be women who, in spite of having six children of their own, take in three more orphans. Um, or they may be uh, you know, Malawian doctors like Wilson, with whom we hope to work closely, who after you know, decades of, of not having the tools, still maintains faith in medicine and public health and maintains faith in people like us, frankly, because there have been a lot of NGOs going in and out of Africa. And, uh, and it, there's a really wonderful sister NGO uh, based here uh, and associated, associated with the university. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I encourage you to support their, their work, HAI, and uh, our work is very similar. We're committed to, um, using, to using the fruits of science and technology, modernity re really, uh, on behalf of people living in poverty. And that may be sometimes uh, the fight against AIDS or tuberculosis, sometimes uh, you know, getting malaria nets out, sometimes it's going to be improving seed quality so farmers can have, uh, uh, not for, you know, Paul Farmer or other farmers like that, but you know, the, <laughs> agricultural worker farmers. Uh, so they can have higher yields. Sometimes it'll be looking for ways to get them fertilizer. Always it will involve looking for clean water and for um, primary school for children. And this is very difficult work. It's not glamorous to talk about all those things at once. It's not, it, it doesn't, you know, people don't rush and say, oh yes, let's go and do poverty reduction. We're looking for magic bullet still. I understand that. We, we all do. But unfortunately, uh, no magic bullet is going to solve the problems that we see, not just in Africa, but also in poor parts of Seattle or Boston or New York, uh, in, parts of, in other parts of our country, my country, certainly in, in Latin America, in parts of Asia. These problems are only going to be solved by sustained attention um, from people like you. And I'm speaking directly, uh, especially, of course, to the undergraduates. And that's why this campaign moved me so much when I read about it, um, that it links, um, again, one, you know, a, a book uh, and a story about an organization, ours, but it links this to local activism. Outside, there are tables of people waiting to sign up students interested in serving locally, uh, or maybe translocally, maybe part-time part here in Seattle sometimes somewhere else. But I believe that the only way that we can move forward uh, and take on these problems is if we do have a proper movement. And that's going to happen only when everybody gets under the tent to fight for some of these basic rights. Thank you very much, and I look forward to a discussion. I hadn't thought about this as a campaign. But, but when, you, when you think about it, it actually, if, if it implies that we, we come together with the, the prospect of moving together and doing something together, then perhaps that's what this common book is. It's indeed a campaign. We, we have some questions for you. We have, as you know, freshman interest groups and freshmen who have come together and written questions. Over 100 questions have been submitted. The first time I heard the word fig, I was thinking of fruit. <laughs> and then I realized it meant freshman interest group. So we have a set of questions. And let's see how many of them we get through. I, too, would like to thank you for coming out this evening. Thank you. Um, on behalf of my fig and probably of everybody here, um, just thanks for sharing with us this evening. Thank you. Um, and we were curious, as a fig, just to know um, what changes you saw in the international community 
in PIH itself and in public response after the publication of the novel. You said novel, well, interesting. <laughs> you're a novel story. <laughs> um, well, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the big battles that we got in, engaged in are described in the book, so they happen before the book. Um, and uh, an example would be the drug-resistant tuberculosis battle. And it just so happened that you know, we had funding from, from the Gates Foundation to, to take this program to scale in one country, Peru, and then on to uh, have a second site, which was in Russia. And so that required a lot of work with the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control. So we were pretty grizzled veterans of this stuff by the time that book came out. But I will say that um, I think it helped a lot w around AIDS, you know, because um, a lot, first of all, and I'll tell you how, not in the way one might think, it was really more a FIG issue, a freshman interest group issue, because the, a lot of students uh, read this book, and there's been a lot of interest on campus, um, on campuses across this country, I don't know about Europe, but certainly in, in, the, in our country, uh, and, and that's created a policy environment that sort of pushed some of the policymakers into making funds available. So um, I think on the AIDS front, this book came out I think in 2003, and uh, by then the Global Fund had been initiated and PEPFAR had been promised, but it really, it helped, you know, it certainly helped our organization, let's put it that way. It helped us expand very significantly. And Tracy Kidder has been very generous to Partners in Health. So. I'm from uh, FIG55 up there. And I was just wondering, um, your life story and <laughs> effort um, to improve the global health is really inspirational, inspirational to all of us. But um, to a college student such as myself and some of us here tonight, um, what do you think is the most important message, realization, or understanding that you would like us to gain from reading Mountains Beyond Me? You know, if I had to choose one thing, which you forced me to do, Fig 55, <laughs> I think the you know, engagement you know, I, I, you know, you could use terms like activism or, but just engagement. I mean, you know, you're, you guys are mostly between 18 and 22. Fair enough. The figs are 18, 19 maybe. And there's a lot of, you know, seductions in a beautiful university like this and a lot of things that are fun to do. And I'm not discouraging you from, well, I'm discouraging you from doing some of them actually. But, um, <laughs> You know, if, if you can develop a little bit of discipline around engagement, you know, with the, could be with a church group or a homeless shelter or, or a, one, of the, one of the groups like, like Partners in, there's not that many groups like Partners in Health, I feel, but there is one like that here. Hel, you know, helping them, um, working, you know, doing something for others who are in, you know, greater need than yourself. I think that'd be the one message. The, it, can I give two or is that like forbidden by no, Fig 55? <laughs> Is it 55? No, what's your fig? 55. Yeah, see, I remember these things. It's like, it's like lab data. Lab data goes in, it stays in. Well, uh, you know, I'd also say that the best thing about being in a, in a great university like this is you've got years, four, don't tell your parents, probably five, uh, in which to learn how to be critical readers of the world around you and of history. And when I look at you know, I don't want to sound partisan at all, okay, um, heaven for fend. Um, but when I look at, you know, how, for example, you know, a nation can go to war based on lies, I think, you know, if the young people, you know, your generation is, becomes critical readers of the world around them and history and just learning how to decipher uh, the news and, be, and remain engaged. I think that'll be good for the rest of the planet. So I'm very much hoping that will be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm from Big 38. <laughs> That's the party fig, clearly. <laughs> We're all very excited that you're here, obviously. DPF! <laughs> That's our nickname for you, DPF, Dr. Paul Farmer. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I got... <laughs> anyway, 
moving on, we have a question for you, serious one. Um, after working in such impoverished countries where one is faced with the reality of death on a regular basis, does death still scare you? And how has your outlook on it changed over the years? Um, yes, yeah, certainly it scares me. Uh, it's, it, it's, um, and my, I don't know that my outlook has changed very much, and I'd like it not to change. You know, not, not about death itself, all right, because rumor has it, and you know, Fig64 did some research to suggest that we're all going to die. <laughs> Um, so I'm not, not death, you know, per se, um, but death among young people, you know, like I said, I mean, obstetrical t catastrophes to me are, are, are just the worst of all. Um, that, that, that's just, you know, I've, I've never become accustomed and hope never to become accustomed to that. And um, I think that the, the change uh, that I feel, which is a, a good change, is that the more, the more of us there are on this task, the fewer of those deaths there will be. You know, of, of the five, half a million women who die in childbirth every, every year, none of those need to happen. Zero. You know, and so it's not as if that's an insuperable challenge. There's no missing vaccine. There's no, we have all the information that we need. We just have to have the ability to reach these women, you know, and, and we've called that in our PIH jargon an, an, eff an effector arm. We have to be able to take good care of these women. And, it, and, and those deaths, which, by the way, lead to a whole, uh, a whole uh, skein of tragedies for the, the surviving children of these women, the, all those deaths would go away, you know. And, uh, you know, again, this, you know, leads us back to issues like women's health and, you know, uh, planning the size of her family rather than, you know, thinking that it's an inexorable fate that you will be pregnant for a twelfth time by the time you're 30. So there's just, to me, uh, those deaths are still just a complete horror show to me. And I, I think we should, you know, be indignant about them and, and have, you know, righteous anger, but a plan to follow. And uh, that's, what, that's why I love working with Partners in Health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our question is, Mountains Beyond Mountains is named after a Haitian proverb which states that after every mountain we climb, there will always be another mountain. Thomas Friedman wrote the novel, The World is Flat. Which well, that is a novel, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this book involves globalization and the idea that the world is merging into a place where there are no obstacles or mountains between societies to climb. Do you think that a flat world will ever be possible when places like Haiti exist? That's a great question. You know, um, I, think that, I think that what we're seeing is, you know, it's true. People say oh, the world's a smaller place. And then, then there's that ad that says smell better. Um, it's true that we're, you know, I just came, as I told you, from Central Africa, you know, to Seattle. I mean, you know, that was not. And it wasn't fun, but it wasn't that difficult either, right? And I got email this morning from Malawi, Haiti, I, in the dean's office using, uh, you know, his wireless access key. Um, sorry about that, Ed. Um, <laughs> I, I hacked in, and I got email from all over the world, you know. And however, you know, this cheerful view of globalization um, is, is not the one that you see if you're looking at it from the point of view of poor people. Because what they see, and, and of course they, there's no they, but many of the people I know as patients see something else. They see all the shiny, beautiful objects and technologies, and then they see themselves nowhere nearer to it. And sometimes even though they are nearer to it, there is some hope. But there, there are these resentments that are born of these inequalities um, that are really only addressed by addressing the inequalities. And so I don't think the world will ever be flat. I think that we can make the world a, a place where there are fewer deadly you know, valleys and jagged peaks and, you know, and, and where, we, where we can share things uh, more effectively with each other. And I, and I also believe, and you know, this may sound naive to some, but I, I also believe that if we do that, if we work hard to do that, that we will have a lot less violence in the world, too. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Farmer. Thank Hello. you for coming here today. Thank you. Um, I'm from Fig 80. And you praise the public health system. Do you have ID? Can you prove that you're from Fig 80? <laughs> <laughs> um, you praise the public health care system of Cuba for its extraordinary health care to all its citizens. My question is, could the United States ever effectively adopt such a system to take care of its citizens in a similar way? If so, what would be some of the struggles associated with adopting a program from a country with a social system so fundamentally different from our own? I did express admiration, and, but I, I believe I qualified you know, that by saying the best place to look at the Cuban medical system is probably from a place like Haiti. You, know, you go from Haiti 90 miles away, you know, um, we, in our country, we can do whatever we want. I mean, we have plenty of resources. We have, we're putting 16% of our GDP in healthcare. That's a lot more than any place else. And we have some spectacular results um, and some good results. We have, for example, the world's best tertiary care hospital. We have the world's biggest medical research infrastructure. We have, uh, you know, you have fantastic clinical care for some. So those, and, and I have to say that I'm lucky. I mean, it, it's, you know, if you, a place like, you know, the Hutch, as I believe you call it, or a similar institution at Harvard, you know, really probably don't get better care, you know, than that at, a, at a place like that. Um, however, that's the issue of the peak, you know. And we don't want to lower the peaks in medicine or education. I'm not saying that at all. But the valleys are pretty low for such an affluent nation as ours. And so I would say, by all means, that we should be able to offer health insurance to all Americans. I mean, it's just not. <laughs> and what's more, most Americans want that. I'm not an expert in this arena, but as a doctor, you know, as, a, as an American, uh, I think we need to have you know, proper medical care for our people. You know? and, it's, you know, and I think other better minds than mine, you know, experts in this arena, could put together a, a, you know, a blueprint so that we could have it, and that we, we need to get that if we're going to be a really healthy nation. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. So, so let me say to Christine Niggerbretson, if, if this project, if the book has somehow inspired us to read critically and to, and to think differently and to perhaps engage and do something, then I think this will have been a success. Can we call you DPF now? Oh, can please, we, by DPF, all means. Can, can we, can we, can, Thank you. Can, Thank you. But can we give one final hand to DPF? Thank you all. <laughs>